Let's go to an Instagram question that we received now. Why do so many Christians suffer while lots of people who don't know the Lord or don't care are successful and experience blessing? Yes. No one has asked that before yeah. <laughs> in the history of the world. I mean— Except for all of us. Except for all of us, including Job and, uh, yeah, the psalmist. Mm -hmm. The psalms, like Psalm 73, uh, you know, the uh, Asaph wonders— um, He's, he said, my feet almost slipped when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And I said, good grief, their life seems to be going pretty well. They're, they're sleek and well-fed and well-clothed. The wicked seem to be driving nice cars and uh, having nice lives. Why, why do the godly suffer? Now, this was a very important question because God did promise in, in Deuteronomy, if you obey me, if you follow my laws in my land, then the vineyards will be overflowing with grapes. Fig trees will blossom. Uh, you won't be able to uh, carry uh, all of the wine into the cellar. You won't be able to... Uh, eat all of the meat that, that is provided. I, it will be lush. It will be wonderful. If you break my law, then disease will come upon you, and the land of milk and honey will turn into thorns and thistles, just as in the Garden of Eden. Uh, so there, there, there was that. And Asaph is wondering, well, why does that not seem to be working right now? Why are the wicked winning and the godly suffering. And Asaph says, it wasn't until I walked into the sanctuary that it all clicked. Mm -hmm. And I saw the end of the ungodly. There will, will be a judgment someday. But what did he see when he went into the sanctuary? He saw the altar of incense, you know, the mediation of Christ. He saw the, he saw the altar of uh, sacrifice. We're pointing forward to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Mm. He saw forgiveness for himself. And so now he is the wicked who needs forgiveness. He mm. is the one, he realizes, who needs to be saved. And now it's no longer about why am I suffering in temporal affairs. It's how do I get this forgiveness? Oh, this, now it all makes sense that there will be a judgment one day, but I won't be judged because God has provided a sacrifice. So it's interesting. It's only when he goes into the sanctuary that it all, that it all fits together. Um, and so uh, often in the Christian life, it's the opposite of what we think. Paul says those who suffer with Christ will reign with Christ. That goes against the prosperity gospel and so much of what we, we get in our culture and our, in our thinking. We don't believe in karma, all right? We're not Hindus. Every other religion besides Christianity believes in some form of karma. And that makes sense because karma actually is true in the general scheme of things. God set the world up in such a way that if you give out bad, you get back bad. If you give out good, you get back good. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. The problem is the world is fallen, and we are fallen. And so now what we get back, even though we dish out garbage, what we get back is the robe of Christ's righteousness. He takes our rags and gives us his robe. That is the marvelous thing uh, about the gospel— and when, when, that, when, when, when you have that, when you have Christ, you realize that's all I need, regardless of how things go with me. In fact, even suffering itself can be a sign that I belong to him, because those who are united to Christ will suffer, but we don't suffer alone. We suffer with him. We don't go looking for crosses. They'll find us. But when we are given these times of trial and suffering, it's not because 
God is angry with us. It's not because we are the wicked and we have given out bad karma and now it's coming back to us. Rather, it's because God has a purpose, even in what seems purposeless and senseless to us, and is working all things together for his purposes, his glory, and our good.